Welcome to another very exciting edition of the Magic Sandwich Show. We've got a wonderful panel this week, uh, who I will introduce shortly. But there have been a couple of news items uh, this week that I do want to mention that may provoke some uh, of you to want to call in. The first is that there was the Republican Conference in Tampa, and there are three short stories that I want to refer to in relation to that. The first is that uh, a Reverend Justin Peters uh, appeared on television, national television, um, saying that she had been praying that uh, Hurricane Isaac, which looked as at that time as if it might be heading towards Tampa, uh, had shifted. And she praised the good Lord for answering her prayers, thereby revealing, in my view, the capricious nature of her God. Because what did God do if indeed he had answered her prayers? He sent it to hit New Orleans again. Did she pray for them? Don't know. The second story in in relation to the conference was that there was a no gun zone within seven of seven mile radius of the conference. This is the party that wants everyone to have the right to own guns, but they didn't allow it within seven miles of their conference. Blows my my mind. And the third story uh, was that a couple of the uh, attendees uh, at the conference were thrown out because they had thrown nuts at a black female camera woman as she was recording the event, shouting, this is how we feed animals. What a lovely bunch of people they are. As I say, it may provoke some, uh, some to call in. There's another story that I do have to mention, and this, this uh, came out today. Some of you may be aware that there was a young girl uh, in Pakistan, a Christian girl, um, who was arrested uh, two weeks ago um, for blasphemy. It turns out that today, the imam who actually made the initial allegations against her has been arrested himself for blasphemy. The allegations against him are that um, some burnt papers were brought to him by a witness. He added a few pages of the Quran to the burnt papers and then provided this as evidence against her. She is, depending on which report you read, somewhere between 11 and 14 years of age. She has learning difficulties, mentally handicapped. And he did it, so the allegations uh, say, uh, to get back at Christians. The odd thing is, though, the odd thing, the sweet irony is, of course, by adding pages of the Quran, he desecrated the Quran. That, in Pakistan, amounts to blasphemy. So now he is facing charges of blasphemy and potentially the death penalty. Do I have sympathy for him? I have to say, I have always been staunchly opposed to the death penalty. But in this case, he went out of his way to fabricate evidence against a handicapped young teenager. No, no sympathy at all. Anyway, that's my rant. Let's get on with it. There are other announcements I have to make, particularly in relation to next weekend. We'll come on to those later. Let me introduce to the panel. Firstly, Concordance, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Secondly, Michael, who has been a regular panelist. Um... Michael is the National Director for the Centre of uh, for Inquiry in Canada. Um, but our special guest today is uh, Andrew Copson, who is the Chief, Chief Executive of the British Humanist Association. I'm going to start with you, if I may, Andrew. Um, firstly, in relation to the organisation, tell us what work you do. Well, the British Humanist Association has quite a wide range of work. I mean, we've been around for quite a while, since 1896. And since that time, we've spent... Um, a lot of our energy is on promoting humanism as an approach to life. So supporting uh, people have a non-religious view of uh, reality and morality and, and meaning um, to understand that that view isn't incoherent and second best. It's a, uh, a respectable um, and rational and ethical position. Um, we provide a lot of education resources uh, for schools and other contexts on non-religious philosophies. We do an enormous amount of advocacy and parliamentary and government lobbying work. Um, on things like freedom of speech, on state-funded faith schools, on secularism to try and uh, bring the constitution of the UK more into line with a secular ideal. And we also provide um, trained celebrants who do things like non-religious funerals um, to make sure that people who aren't religious also have access to important ceremonies to mark times in their life. So it's a pretty wide uh, range of work that we do. I have to say that I've attended two funerals um 
in which a one of the members of your organisation uh, conducted the service, and I have to say that I thought they were absolutely wonderful. They're so much better than the nonsense that you hear at religious uh, uh, gatherings. But um, on a personal level, obviously, um, being in the position you are, I'm taking it that you are uh, an atheist, or as you probably describe yourself, uh, as a humanist. Did you ever have any um, religious upbringing? Were you religious at any stage? Um, tell us about that. No, I never was. I mean, um, I, my parents weren't religious. My grandparents weren't religious. Uh, my mother would be a self-described uh, humanist, maybe her parents too. Um, so I never experienced any sort of religious upbringing. Um, nothing really at school. I went to very secular schools. Um, and I was in almost uh, blissful ignorance of the uh, existence of uh, <laughs> most uh, religions and, and quite often religious people, really, until I went to university when I encountered my first sort of serious Christians. And in my own uh, school and university education, I was, I was a historian, so I studied the classical uh, pre-Christian world, and my other period was Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment uh, history, so I also missed out all, on any knowledge of the sort of historical <laughs> period of uh, religion, at least in in Europe as well. So I never had any religious upbringing. I think there's a, I think that that's quite common for people um, sort of of my age and below. I mean, it's one of the things we often think about when we're thinking about how we support non-religious people, you know, in the UK from the BHA, British Humanist Association's point of view, is that there is this real sort of demographic shift between non-religious people um, who were raised in some sort of religion but rejected it and non-religious people who are non-religious because they never have been. It's like the default position, hopefully increasingly, um, of, of future generations of people. I think that's quite an interesting uh, demographic shift. It's certainly true of me. Yes, and I, I think it would be... Uh, the majority of our audience, I suspect, is um, based in the United States, and I think that for them, um, they, they don't really appreciate that for us in the United Kingdom, religion is very much um, a background... Yeah. It, it, it doesn't have any significant bearing on people's everyday lives, apart Absolutely. from five minutes on the uh, Today programme on Radio 4. Um, now, uh, because I, 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 a couple of things I should have said, um, Andrew may have to leave us before the show, so I'm going to sort of like, uh, as I say, save some of the announcements till later. But just to remind people, it is a live call-in show. If you would like to join the show, please um, send a Skype contact request to Magic Sandwich Show, including in that the gist of the topic or question that you would like to ask. And I've been criticised for asking for that information recently. The reason I do is to try and ensure some continuity in the callers and the conversation as the way it goes. There are a number of topics that we are trying to get through today. The first it relates to assisted suicide. And um, if you had seen the um, previews on the Magic Sandwich Show website, you would appreciate that Andrew Copson appeared on national television recently talking about the case of Tony Nicklinson. Um, for the sake of those that may not uh, know the story, Andrew, could I ask you to explain that and, and your involvement? Yeah, sure. Tony Nicklinson uh, was a man who, um, until just a few years ago, uh, led an extremely active and uh, full life. He was a bit of a, a globetrotter by all accounts and um, you know, jumped out of planes and did a lot of sort of uh, sports and hiking and climbing. And then, unfortunately, he suffered a stroke, which... Um, left him after that point with a syndrome known as locked-in syndrome. He was unable to move. Um, he was essentially paralysed from, from, from the neck down. And he did not want to continue to live um, in this condition. Or more accurately, he wanted to be able to choose at some future point um, to have medical assistance to bring a dignified end to a life that he thought um, was no longer a life he wanted to live. Now, the law in England and Wales um, does not allow uh, medical assistance to people who are unable to end their own lives to assist them to end them. Some countries uh, in the world now do. Um, some uh, states in America uh, now do, but England and Wales does not. Now, there are various campaigners in Britain, this comes, to, I'll come now to the, the BHA's own role in this, there are various campaigners in Britain who have campaigned over the last few years for people who are terminally ill to have the legal right to medical assistance. But Tony Nicholson was not terminally ill. Um, he could live for 10 or 20 or perhaps 30 uh, miserable years um, in this condition. And so he went to court 
um, to try and seek uh, a legal ruling that his human rights were being breached by his not being allowed medical assistance to die. Now, he lost uh, his case and he was going to appeal, um, but shortly after the, the ruling came down that he lost, um, in fact, he contracted pneumonia, um, he refused food and he uh, died a couple of days afterwards. So the British Humanist Association has a long has a long standing policy that the law in England and Wales, um, Scotland's a slightly different jurisdiction, the law in England and Wales should be changed to allow mentally competent people who are either terminally ill or incurably suffering to be allowed medical assistance uh, to end their lives on the grounds that it's compassionate, that it's the only way to respect the autonomy of people, and also that there's an equality argument. Suicide is perfectly legal in England and Wales. You and I can end our lives tomorrow should we choose. Uh, to do so. Hopefully we won't and hopefully our life will be worth living. Um, but if we do, it's not illegal, as it used to be, um, to try to end your own life or to end it. Um, someone who cannot physically do that for themselves, it seems to me, um, should have uh, the compassionate thing to do is to give that person assistance. So that's our position. And that's why we were speaking out about uh, Tony's case. And we were also trying um, with his family and his lawyers um, to find another person possibly in his position who'd be willing to take the case forward because if that's possible in the next few days then maybe his appeal will still be able to be heard um, but in some other person's name who's in his position and um, so that's what was happening in the last few days um, increasingly the public uh, in this country at least support the idea opinion polls and surveys show again and again that a huge majority of people uh, from 70 to 90 percent of people support um, these rights being introduced. So hopefully in the future, politicians will have the bravery to, to make that change. Well, I hope so. I don't think there's much optimism. Um, but I, I think you're right. It, for me, um, I think it's an ultimate human right to determine how you're going to die. Um, of course, I'm not talking about those who may be um, suffering from some sort of mental illness, depression or whatever. But in the circumstances of his case, I, I, I really find it extraordinary that he basically had to starve himself to death, then suffer pneumonia and die a week after the judgment. Um, but the law is different in different countries. I know in some um, European countries, uh, assisted suicide is legal. But we're going to go to Michael first uh, to tell us what the position is in Canada. Uh, and then hopefully concordance, if you can tell us what the position is in uh, America. Michael. So in, in Canada, it's recently come up for debate. Um, our organization, Center for Inquiry, um, sort of unlike the Humanist Association's, doesn't have a strong policy on uh, uh, assisted suicide or assisted dying. Um, <clears throat> the way we chose to... Uh, tackle with this issue was to hold a series of debates across the country um, where we had the president of Dying with Dignity Canada uh, debate a series of opponents. Um, some of them were legal professionals. So we had the uh, president of uh, Choices and Illusion from the U U.S. come up. Um, we had uh, doctors in Toronto, the one I saw personally, we had the, the um, chief executive of the Catholic Bioethics Institute. Um, again, we're not taking a strong position on any of these things, but just welcoming the debate and hoping that that in the course of a debate or in the course of an exchange, that people would understand the issues that come about. Um, in Canada, especially, it is a very interesting debate because um, decades ago in 1972, suicide was, was removed from the criminal code. So unlike the debate that often happens in the States where it's about consistency of the law with suicide, it becomes more about the role of the state and what rights physicians have in the course of their care. Um, and so there's a number of, of interesting issues that come out. And I thought all of the debates were, were handled very well from both sides. And we got a lot of um, interesting discussion on the, the limitations of state rights um, protection of people, whether you're protecting the person or if you're protecting them from harm, um, limits to the Hippocratic Oath. And so really on that side, um, we're looking at a number of case challenges there at the Supreme Court of Canada um, that are coming up in the next few months, and we're eagerly looking at how those are going to be resolved. It looks from a legal standpoint um, like it's about 50-50 exactly how that's going to be handled um, because our charter, again, is is written in a very different way than uh, the Constitution of the U.S. or uh, the rights codes in Britain as well. 
Um, so we're we're looking at that, and uh, speaking just for myself, I found the evidence in favor of assistant dying, assisted dying much more compelling. Um, I, I wasn't convinced very strongly on the side uh, of the Catholic Bioethics Institute or even the lawyers or doctors who were talking about really the rights of um, elderly or disabled people and showed a lot of genuine concern for that side of things. I found that, I, I think I'm in agreement with both uh, DPR and Andrew, that it is a fundamental right um, that there is an enormous amount of suffering that happens at end of life and that it is the most, most dignified choice for people to allow them, um, again, in Canada, that you're allowed to commit suicide, but you don't have access to ways to allow you to do it in a dignified way. So what happens to a lot of Canadians when they're they're put in these positions, they, they can hang themselves, they can asphyxiate in the backseat of a car, um, they can overdose on Tylenol, which are all very horrible, or starve themselves to death. Like, very uh, horrifying, like, undignified ways to die. But they're not allowed to access into... Um, into um, medicines and, and resources that would allow them to die in ways that are much more dignified, much more peaceful, much more um, humane, in my opinion. Concordance. And then we come to the religious fundamentalist center of the world, the United States, where euthanasia is illegal in every state of the Union, by, by federal statute, as I understand um, there, there, there are physician-assisted dying, I think, PAD. And the only reason I know anything about this, obviously this has not been part of my activism. Um, my wife works in hospice, so, so she deals with a lot of end-of-life care. Um, and and you, the most they will allow, and a lot of this is the influence of fundamentalist religion. In fact, in public surveys, it's always the... Baptists, over the Catholics even, uh, who strongly oppose any measures to legalize euthanasia or, or physician-assisted uh, dying. But um, there are, I think, three or four states that do allow for a doctor to set up a machine that someone could use uh, in a facilitated way, but it has to be... Uh, administered by the patient themselves. In other words, someone who was locked in would not be eligible for PAD simply because they could not push the button. They couldn't pull the trigger. They couldn't do whatever it is that, that the physician uh, can set up for them to, to bring their life to an end. Um, so it, it's, it's, we are, I'm sure, way behind all the other modern countries in terms of our understanding of euthanasia. Um, and as I understand it, suicide is still legal in most states as well, uh, and I'm not quite sure how that's enforced. I don't know how legally that would work. Do you, do you put the corpse in jail after they've died? I, I think probably not. I've always thought that it is a, a terrible dilemma for someone who's so depressed. I, 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 such dark humor, I'm sorry. But someone who's so depressed they want to kill themselves, they find that they haven't succeeded and then face prosecution. Um, but on well, a more serious note, I'd like to go back, if I may, because as we've been talking, I've uh, recalled a case. Um, and again, Andrew, you can probably give more details than I can. This is about uh, June of this year. Uh, the High Court ruled that a um, woman, I think of about 30, who uh, was suffering from uh, anorexia, um, wanted to take her own life. And um, the court ruled... Um, that she couldn't, and in fact, it was, a, it was. I think it was a claim made by those that were caring for her. Were they allowed to force feed her? I mean, the whole idea of force feeding someone brings up horrible images for me, but the court ruled that, yes, they were. Uh, and I know that ADT, who is um, going to be our first caller, I'm going to bring in in a moment, uh, is commenting in the uh, in the blog uh, thing about, uh, you know, depre people with depression, you know, you shouldn't allow them to suicide. That's, I don't think that's what any of us are saying. We're saying that in certain circumstances, and there will be safeguards enforced if it ever becomes statute, in certain circumstances, certain circumstances, it is more dignified to allow a person to die. Andrew? It's, ex 
it's extremely important that there are safeguards anywhere that legalizes either physician assisted suicide or any sort of assisted dying, that there should be safeguards to ensure that the people who are choosing um, to have an assisted death are genuinely choosing it. So they need to be mentally competent to make that choice. I mean, there can't be any question of there being um, mental health issues. It needs to be a settled decision, you know, a decision that has held good over a period of time. There really does need to be, you know, it can't be uh, something that you can decide. And then two hours later, you've got the prescription and you can, um, you know, end your life. And in in most jurisdictions around the world, whether we're in the states of the United States of America that have legalized some measure of physician assisted dying or in the parts of Europe that have done so, um, in almost every single case, there are very rigorous safeguards as to uh, mental health, which is precisely to uh, ensure that people with uh, severe depression, which is medically uh, treatable, um, don't have, you know, that choice. So some limitations on the choice of assistance to die, I think, are entirely legitimate. Um, to protect people um, who are not mentally competent to make that decision for themselves. So I think the criteria are, you know, mental competence, you have to really be making a, a choice. It has to be a genuine choice that's uncoerced um, by other uh, people around you. And I think it has to be a settled choice, a choice that has held good over a period of time. And if those criteria can be met, then I think we can hope that we'll um, certainly prevent as many people um, as possible um, from uh, slipping through the net and ending up with an assisted death when perhaps they didn't really uh, want one. Well, it's it's a difficult question, isn't it? Because obviously at the time they do want one, whether that's born out of depression or or, or whatever. But certainly, it is extremely it, difficult. It is extremely difficult. Yeah. But you know, lot, lots of people want lots of things at a time when they're uh, perhaps not mentally competent to do so, and there are there are parallels uh, in other areas of our um, public and criminal law that don't allow people to do. Uh, certain things or that people are assessed to do uh, to see if they're able to do certain things before they're provided you know on the state there's many such examples within our own national health system and within our own social services you know the adoption or fostering of children or other big decisions that people make for which we require a measure of mental competence to be assessed rather than just to say yes whatever you want you know here you go Concordance, I'm going to come to you, but I note that somebody has posted in the chat that suicide is legal in the US. We will look into that, but you wanted to make another comment. Concordance. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this is a good opportunity to share with everyone who's listening the importance of having an advanced directive um, and, and having some sort of legal document expressing your wishes because when the time comes, and this is especially triply, quadruply true, um, for someone who is um, gay and doesn't have a, a legally recognized marriage, there have been so many cases where the power of attorney, a power, power of attorney, goes to someone who I think the person would not want making those decisions. So it is vitally important that you you talk to a lawyer, get this done, write something down, um, whatever you can, so that that your wishes are made clear. That's all. Well, if no one wants to come back on that comment, I think we'll uh, go to our first caller, ADT. Can I just remind people that it's a live call-in show. If you would like to join us, send a Skype contact request to Magic Sandwich Show. Include in that the gist of the topic or question you'd like to ask about at the moment. As ever, during the first hour, there are very few people that want to talk to us. Um, but in the second hour, it just goes crazy. So try and contact us now to uh, have the best chance of appearing. ADT, I noticed that you made a lot of comments. Uh, it's not quite the topic that you wanted to talk about, but you made a lot of comments in the chat. But, uh, let's deal with some of those first. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I guess what I was bringing up is that uh, what actually... Um What's the actual criteria for having a disability, a, a sort of a disabling condition? And um, in a medical sense, if you just look at it from a, a, a disabling condition, say depression, for instance, um, people would say it disables them; it stops them from living life, their life. But uh, someone else did bring up in the uh, in the chat a another part of that criteria is that it also mu must be. Um, untreatable, which I think Andrew also brought up. And I, I think then that does make a good criteria. If, um, in the simplest sense, the uh, two criteria to determine whether someone should uh, be allowed to be euthanized would be that one, they have to have a life de de um, 
disabling disease, which stops them from living properly, and secondly, it mustn't be treatable or easily treatable. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's absolutely right. Sorry, I know Michael uh, wanted to say something. Michael? Yeah, um, the definition does change slightly from country to country. The one that I think a lot of people prefer, or a lot of the ad gets for assisted dying prefer is the Belgian model, where it has to be a terminal disease. Um, it has to have stayed with it, with the person, and the decision has to have been made for over a long period of time. Um, so I think the waiting period is something up to uh, six months. But there's also a psychiatric review that happens, and this is the this is an important criteria that's being investigated in Canada right now, which is that there should be a psychiatric component to it to understand that this person is making a fully competent uh, decision, that it is a legitimate choice, as as Andrew uh, stated. Well, Andrew, can you um, maybe add to that? Uh, as I said um, previously, there are some countries in um, Europe that allow assisted suicide, and in fact, it was actually an option for Tony to go to one of those countries. I, I can't remember if it was um, Switzerland or not. Do you know what the legislation is in the countries that do allow it? Well, I mean, that's right. I mean, he, he probably couldn't have gone um, to Switzerland, actually, because Switzerland is, is, is pretty clear, I believe, that the, um, the lethal dosage must be self-administered. Um, which he wasn't uh, able to do. Um, similarly, as, as Michael said, that the law in Belgium um, also isn't particularly helpful for people who are dissect, you know, physically impaired to the extent that they can't take, um, take the dose themselves. And in, in any case, it only covers um, terminal illness. Um, now, I think that actually I mean, the Belgian law is, as I understand it, very well um, regulated and very well implemented, and so I'm 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 a fan of it in the, in the sense that it works. But I don't think it's right that it that it should limit assisted dying to terminally ill people. I mean, I come back to what I said at the beginning. Tony Nicholson was not terminally ill. He could have gone on living a totally miserable life of torture and suffering for 30 years. Um, there was another case um, last year in the UK of a, a, a much younger man who um, had had uh, an injury on the sports field and, again, become paralysed from the neck down. Again, he wasn't terminally ill. He could have been sustained, you know, by medical science for decades, um, many, many decades, perhaps. Um, so I don't think that terminal illness should be um, a criterion. I think um, I think I'm I think the only jurisdiction in Europe um, that makes wide provision for people who are not terminally ill is the Netherlands, um, where people certainly are allowed um, to end their own uh, lives um, without being terminally ill. And I think that what's interesting there is that there's also been a, a lot of recent investment in, in palliative care um, for, for terminally ill uh, people as well, on the other hand, which is sort of the other side of society's, the other, you know, the flip side of the coin of society's responsibility is to take care of people and, and give them dignity because some people also want to live and I think they should be allowed um, to do that and supported uh, in doing that as well. So I think that although um, some of the laws in Europe um, and some of the laws in, in places like Oregon in the United States um, are generally good and are, and are quite uh, represent quite good progress. Um, certainly, I think that the um, the non terminal illness uh, criterion um, is yet to be properly implemented um, anywhere, and that's really what made the the British Humanist Association support for Tony Nicholson's case. Um, distinctive. So there's a there's an organisation called Dignity in Dying in the United Kingdom, which used to be called the Voluntary Euthanasia Society, for example, um, which explicitly came out and said that they didn't support Tony Nicholson's um, case because they only advocated for um, assisted dying for people who were terminally ill. So that the British Humanist Association really as an organisation was the only organisation that was saying um, no people's choices should be respected and it's compassionate to respect those choices, um, whatever uh, whether it's term, terminal illness or not. And I believe, I mean, Michael might be able to tell us something more about this, but I believe that recently there was a, a ruling in the Supreme Court in British Columbia that said um, that um, a, a woman who had, I think, Lou Gehrig's, uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, the disease, oh, it was, yeah, it was Lou Gehrig's disease, um, that uh, the law in Canada effectively discriminated against her because um, of her disability, because she was unable to commit suicide, um, and she was given leave by the court to seek physician assistance to end her own life um, pending, you know, 
the the appeal and 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 waiting to see a year from then if uh, the federal parliament of of kind of do anything about it. And that's really, I think, where the Tony Nicholson case is interesting, exploring whether or not um, we're willing to go beyond the criterion just of terminal illness and saying, you know, incurable suffering and permanent disability, are they also uh, situations where we're willing to allow physicians to do suicide? And I think that we should be, because the moral argument um, is, if anything, stronger to prevent 30 years of suffering than to prevent a year of suffering in the case of a terminally ill person. But I think that's where some people, even non-religious people, might might have, you know, disagreements. Michael, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, I, I think the case Andrew is describing is the Rodriguez case. And yeah, it's and it, Canada is an interesting when you're talking about having this sort of in, enlightened Europe and sort of a religiously more conservative America. Um, Canada does seem to be a nice blend of the two. So we have, uh, in a lot of ways, mixtures of both and influences from both sides. Um, and one of the things that came out recently in this Rodriguez case in British Columbia, which could still be overruled, this is why I say that it could, uh, it's the Supreme Court challenge now. It's what they, uh, the defense was arguing, what this uh, young woman was arguing was she has a right to commit suicide and she wants that as a choice. She was arguing based on, um, on a type of discrimination, um, backing on the Constitution that says if the government is providing a service or allowing a right, then it has to be equally accessible to all peoples regardless of their uh, their physical abilities, their race, their religion, their, uh, their gender, all of these sorts of things. So actually using this as a te- and framing it as an anti-discrimination law, which, and again, I do find that case very, very compelling, that... Um, if you have the right to something and the government approves that right, uh, which in the case of suicide they do, then what, if you're not physically able to uh, manifest that right in some way, then there should be an option available to you in order to carry out your wishes, because essentially that is the reason why the government is affirming that right in the first place, or the charter is affirming that right in the first place. Concordance, I think you wanted to clarify something you mentioned earlier, and then we'll come back to your second point, ADT. Concordance. Well, I just wanted to clarify, it's not, um, it's no longer a felony in the U.S. to commit suicide, but it's still considered a sort of a common law um, crime, which which has bearing in court cases that involve, say, recovery of harm. Someone committing suicide is is on a much weaker footing than someone that say accidentally died. So, those those kinds of issues are still relevant. But I wanted to correct a mistake I made. I would like to explore something if once we've exhausted ADT's question, and that is what what is the scriptural basis? What is the religious basis? What's the origin of laws against assisted suicide. Why, why is that considered the moral position by, by fundamentalists? That opens up a, a huge kind of worms. Um, let, let's um, just actually, before we <coughs> go any further, can I just say that there's someone in the chat called Z-L-A-N-O-U-S, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, who thinks that the issue of entropy in the universe provides evidence for God. Please send a Skype contact request. We will get you on the show to hear your views. Uh, otherwise, stop trolling uh, the room. Thank you very much. ADT, your second point. Um, it just ties in a, into the human rights issue, um, and it could be a slightly controversial topic. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Anyway, I'll start. So uh, there's a guy who lived in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, called uh, Thomas Malthus. Um, you may have heard of him. He's actually one of the uh, big influences to Darwin's theory of natural selection. And uh, he was a reverend um, for the church. And he was essentially one of the first people who managed to come up with the idea that population doesn't actually grow exponentially, that it's actually logarithmic. In other words, it has a, uh, well, slightly logarithmic. It has a carrying capacity, a capacity where it cannot grow any further. And uh, he identified this and he came up with uh, quite some... uh, uh, well, extreme views on uh, population poverty. And um, I'll read one 
quote here from his essay. Um, in this essay, he says, the power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce substance, substance for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. The vices of mankind are active and able ministers of depopulation. They are the precursors to the army of great destruction and often finish the dreadful work themselves. But should they fail in this war of extermination, then sickly reason, seasons, epidemics, pestilence and plague advance in terrific array and sweep off off their thousands and tens of thousands. Should success be still incomplete, gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear with one mighty blow levels the population with the food of the world. And um, essentially the view he started to form is that we shouldn't actually help the poor people and the uh, worse off people as much as we were, such as the uh, I think it was the poor laws through uh, England at that time. We shouldn't actually help the poor people. Um, can I, can I pause you there? Because, we're, 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 yeah, we're, sure. And, Andrew's certainly going to deal with it, but it's slightly off topic, and there are another to couple of topics um, that we want to get in, so um, I'd like to invite Andrew to do it in fairly short form. And can I remind sure. people, please, if you're going to send a contact request, how many times do I have to say this? Include in that the gist or the topic of the question that you want to talk about. Otherwise, it's ignored. I've just ignored three people for that reason. Uh, please, I don't know how many times or how, how much more clear I can make that statement. Andrew, what are you going to deal with this in short form before we move on to the next topic? Andrew. I don't know if I have too much to say about it, apart from to say that I think the, the, the bringing in of um, Malthusian ideas to this debate is, is, is potentially interesting and also um, potentially very inappropriate. I think that um, it's interesting to the extent that it illustrates how um, we have, as a society, moved way, way beyond the sort of pressures that Malthus um, was aware of. And there is no doubt, for example, that if it were not for our medical advances of the last um, decades, um, we wouldn't be in this situation. One of the reasons why assisted dying comes up as an issue is because we're just so much better now at keeping people alive. Um, and treating people um, and, you know, uh, you know, sustaining life. Um, I think it's and it's interesting, perhaps, to reflect on whether or not in that sort of um, world and in the world of uh, socialised medicine and social democracy that we live in, at least in in Western Europe. It's an interesting question to ask whether Malthusian ideas really are relevant anymore. And I would hope that it, to a large degree um, they weren't. But. And, it, and that a modern discourse of human rights and, and social democracy would largely um, overwrite um, Malthusian analysis of this. But, you know, in, in a second way, um, I think that Malthus still has interesting things to tell us about how we treat the question um, of population internationally. I think that's too much of a, um, a red herring to get into now. But I certainly do think that although Malthus was wrong, in the, because he thought that there would be, you know, terrible famines in Europe and so on within within his lifetime or soon afterwards. Um, I think certainly in terms of population um, in the world today, Malthus is becoming um, more relevant um, again. So I'm not sure what relevance it has necessarily to the, the debate um, on assisted dying, but I think it's very interesting.